And I want to thank you all for joining us. It's a Friday. It's a Friday night. You could be anywhere else and you've chosen to be here. And we're really deeply uh, appreciative for your uh, showing up and being here. It's good to see familiar faces and, uh, and maybe not so much uh, familiar faces. But we're excited to talk about this last caravan, this last friend shipment caravan that we pulled together. Uh, it took place in November. It was the first caravan that we've organized um, due to COVID uh, since 2019. Um, so we missed 2020. We were able to do this at the end of 2021. There were some people I'm looking at, my dear friend Lenny, who you know wasn't able to join us this time, but we're hopeful that you know, well, we'll think maybe about next time. Um, a lot of really exciting and interesting folk who were able to be a part of the caravan and we, we're gonna hear from them. And so we're grateful that you're here. We're grateful that they're here and that we can do that. But before we jump into tonight's program, there's a couple of people we need to recognize. Um, we're excited not only to talk about the caravan, but to talk about the work that many of the people who have been doing this work on, in so many different ways have been um, present and uh, supportive and a member of the caravan fam family, and some of whom we have lost over this last period of time that we want to take a quick moment to lift up inspiring activists and uh, uh, who have been engaged in the Cuba solidarity work for so many different years. One was Tony Ryan. Some people knew him. Tony Ryan was a West Coast uh, activist. Uh, I really only got to know Tony in the last few years um, in the fight against the U.S. blockade of Cuba. But Tony was a passionate and um, compassioned fighter for justice on so many different fronts. And um, we will forever uh, remember him for his commitment to the fight for uh, fight against uh, and the fight for uh, those uh, who've been disenfranchised. Um, and it's been evident in the various levels in which he has worked. So we just want to lift up our, our brother, Tony Ryan. Secondly, um, Chuck Kaufman. Some of you knew Chuck. Chuck, uh, I knew for many years, uh, going back to his years in, in, in Washington, D.C., at uh, the Nicar Nicaragua Network um, Network in Washington, D.C. It was a, a stall, or was a, a, a place where people who were doing all kinds of work to support um, work uh, for justice on different fronts were able to organize uh, activities, uh, organize uh, anything from, you know, the uh, campaigns to, or, uh, to galvanize people to come to DC, uh, to just being able to be a, a, a place where people could speak and resonate and talk about the work that was so important to so many of us. Um, Chuck was not just involved with Cuba, not just involved with Nicar Nicaragua, but he was somebody who was engaged in, in, as an anti-imperialist uh, in the good fight on so many different fronts. And uh, we're grateful for the work that, that uh, Chuck did. I wanna just quickly say that one of the things that Chuck did for IFCO, when we were in the midst of our fight against the IRS, who was coming after us because of our support of our friends in Palestine, were uh, prepared to take away and did take away our tax exempt status. And Chuck was able to provide a place for so many of those different groups who were supported by IFCO, uh, gave them a home, not just Chuck, but I mean, it was, you know, it was the Alliance for Global Justice and um, Chuck at the forefront who said, Gail, we've got you. We've got these groups. We're gonna continue to support their work and we're not gonna allow this attack by the IRS to stop us. And that's just one of the great memories I have of our dear friend Chuck. And so we're grateful for not only his assistance at that time, but also for his years of steadfast solidarity. And lastly, but not least, um, we wanna lift up our friend Alicia Harapko, who I like to refer to as a member of the Cuba uh, family, the Cuba family, the Cuba solidarity family, uh, but specifically IFCO's family as it related to that work uh, for so many years. She was a spokesperson on a number of um, friendship and caravan routes. Uh, 
um, as the caravans crisscrossed the U.S. Um, she was able to highlight the truth about Cuba and was a friend and a comrade uh, that we could always count on. And of course, worked on so many different um, campaigns, the campaign to bring Elian home, the campaign to bring the Cuban Five home, the campaign to you know release different political prisoners on multiple levels, Alicia was there. And there's so much more that we will be highlighting and sharing and supporting and lifting up about our sister Alicia in the coming days and weeks and months, but uh, we couldn't um, begin a program uh, without um, lifting up these three stalwarts and just saying, you know, Tony Ryan, Chuck Hoffman, Alicia Harapko, in our hearts, um, presente. So I want to just shift us very quickly um, to um, talk more about the work that it, was engaged and brought us together during this last caravan. Um, IFCO has been organizing caravans to Cuba since 1992. And we are tremendously um, proud of the people who have been willingly been able to step out and speak out and act out against injustice and to say, you know what, we're gonna go, we're gonna go to Cuba we're going to do this because we feel we have a right and a responsibility to do so, but also to highlight what it is to be a friend of Cuba. Um, so many of the people who were engaged in this last caravan, and we'll be hearing a little bit more about the fact that there were new numbers, new people that were engaged in this 31st friendship and caravan that we just took down in uh, November. Um, that really learned and, um, and, and were inspired by the uh, revolution that Cuba has uh, engaged in and has lifted up and has used as an example for those of us, those of us who are wanting to fight against injustice, fighting against the powers, to say this is an example of what it means to stand, stand in solidarity with the people. Cuba offers us that. And we're so excited that through the Friendship and Caravan, through these um, years of organizing um, an opportunity for people to go and see and witness Cuba for themselves, that we were able to bring a lot of new people, people who were jazzed, power, empowered and excited. And I keep looking to some of my peers, Mark and Cheryl and, and others, who have been engaged in this work for so long, but there was something really, really superly special about this caravan. Uh, we had the opportunity to bring people from different sectors, um, whether that be related to, you know, religious freedom, related to their, you know, the connection as uh, people of faith, as people of conscience, a people of, um, uh, you know, who have been engaged in this work because they're committed to the fight for housing or for uh, you know, healthcare or for education. Um, there's so many different segments of the society that we were able to bring through with this caravan. And as we look at some of the pictures that are reflected on the screen, these were just some of my personal pictures, pictures I just took. And I love this picture. I'm looking all crazy in the front here but I took this little selfie because, you know, I don't know anything about selfies, but I took this picture and all these people that I look at, as I look down that row of that plane, this was us taking off uh, on our way to Cuba. I learned so much from each and every one of them. And that was one of the inspiring aspects of this campaign, of this caravan, was that it wasn't about the old heads imparting on the young people. We learned from them as much as they learned from us. And um, it was inspiring and exciting because I think that there's a lot of young people that have been engaged in um, this important work and are ready to come back and fight and do what they can do uh, to not only lift up the example of what Cuba has represented on all fronts, healthcare, education, Health, um, I said healthcare, um, you know, the uh, uh, LGBT rights, um, um, 
the, um, I'm sorry y'all, I'm getting all excited. I'm getting a little twisted up, um, but um, the uh, area of religion and what that has all meant. Um, and what I'm excited about is that we've got this really, this cadre of young people who have been, who have seen and are willing to come back and talk to their home communities about the importance of doing this incredible work to stand in solidarity with Cuba because Cuba represents so much that we as people who have been struggling for justice can hook onto and connect to. We like to say Cuba's not perfect. It's not you know, the panacea, but Cuba represents something that many of us who have been struggling for justice can, justice can um, uh, connect with. And um, so I had the opportunity, I'm so blessed uh, to have had the opportunity to travel with these really wonderful, um, empowered and strong um, uh, activists uh, that have been struggling on multiple fronts to uh, lift up Cuba and talk about what it is that Cuba represents and how it is that we, as we've been struggling for making a better nation, uh, have been able to learn from our brothers and sisters there. So I'm excited that tonight we'll get a chance to talk about the um, uh, experiences that we had as caravanistas. Um, and I want to kind of just take a step back and I want to allow some of the presenters to speak and to talk about their own um, reality and to hear about how it is that we can continue to do the work that Cuba has been able to begin through its revolution, but how it is that we can continue to do this work and on the various fronts that we are committed to engaging in and to do that in a multi-generational, a multi-ethnic way in which um, Cuba in, in many ways uh, provides us with an opportunity, but uh, in also many ways uh, the people who go and see and experience Cuba can come back and um, continue to educate us, continue to help us find different ways to do the work that we're all committed to doing on various levels uh, to build that new and empowered world that uh, we believe is possible and Cuba helps us to, to recognize. So thank you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for allowing me to wax poetically about all the stuff that I think is really and critically important. And thank you for all the presenters that are here to talk about their experiences. And I'm gonna just stop talking and, and push the, the mic, the virtual mic over to my dear sister, Dr. Aisha. Well, uh, before we get started with the presenters, we wanted to present the video to kind of set the tone um, so people can get a real glimpse of what we experienced on the caravan. Uh, hopefully it'll bring, you know, rem everyone who is here, I'm sure plenty of Caravanistas um, are here just to reminisce and relive um, that experience and that connection that we all shared um, back in November. So I'm going to share that video first, and then we'll start with Dr. Aisha Fields. Thank you. Thank you. I came to Cuba because so many people I know have said that it's a place you can read about, but you gotta come here to understand. Um, and so the first opportunity that I got, shout out to Pastor for Peace, I was like, I'm coming, I wanna see this revolutionary socialist project 90 miles off the shore of the United States. Because I wanted to see what it could be like when the working class is in charge of the state, um, what uh, socialism has to offer um, our poor people across the world, um, and also just to make connections with comrades here. To celebrate the victory of the vaccines that Cuba developed here in Cuba, uh, over the pandemic and the example that Cuba sets uh, for us in the United States and the rest of the world in solidarity um, and its belief that humanity is our homeland. To really come 
to like a socialist country and like see it with my own eyes. Um, it's been such an amazing experience. We came on the caravan because as to form revolution, we have to be in all the places where all the people are. I came to Cuba because I believe in socialism and Cuba is a North Star for the working class struggles that we're fighting for in a world that's free from progressive capitalism that just causes death and destruction. Um, and I wanted to see it for myself, I wanted to see it in action, and I wanted to learn from um, all the healthcare, the education, the social infrastructure, uh, the media, the people, the art, the culture, the politics, and the revolution that's here. We learn from the doctors, learn from the health professionals, learn from the government officials on how all of these things communicate and work together so that I can bring it back home to the communities we need it, which are the black and brown communities of our country. I wanted to get first-hand experience on what these people really are, how they really are, what they really feel, what's really truly important to them, and what their value systems are. I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with Shaquille and so many who are sending out hearts and, and, and claps and um, wow, what a, I'm telling you, this was a special caravan folk and it was great and it was really good to see Anna Maria Cardenas and so many people sending um, good wishes, people who have been connected to this work in so many ways. But um, what I'm really excited about is the fact that we had new people, we had new caravanistas, folks that we hadn't had a chance to, to uh, travel with before. So our first speaker, the first person that we'd like to bring uh, forward is uh, Dr. Aisha Field. Uh, Aisha, who is, you know, she's the daughter of a dear friend of mine, my dear sister, uh, Michelle Strongfield, who keeps me on track. And um, I, I learned and, and felt so much from her daughter as well. Dr. Aisha is an applied physical, uh, I'm sorry, an applied optical uh, physicist and international director of the all African People's Development and Empowerment Project, or the AAPDEP, as AAEPDEP's -E director, Aisha serves uh, on the National uh, Central Committee of the African the uh, People's Socialist Party, and has helped to organize and coordinate the organization's community-based uh, uh, healthcare agricultural and educational programs since the organization was founded in 2007. Aisha really kind of came along with um, other members of the party to really talk about the work of the party to help expand ways uh, that we might be able to engage in um, a better understanding of what Cuba's approach to healthcare is. And so I'm excited that she's here. She can be here. She's been appointed head of the COVID-19 People's War Commission established by uh, the chairperson of uh, the, uh, the party and uh, can really talk, I think, a little bit more about really what the interest was about merging uh, the party's interest in healthcare and what it means to bring Cuba's approach to, uh, uh, to what it means to provide health for the people um, and how that, that can be uh, made real and realized um, in, in real terms um, here in the United States. So Aisha, I just wanna give you the floor, um, hear from you. It's good to see you sister. And I'm so um, grateful that we got a chance to travel together, but talk to us, tell us about, um, uh, what's on your heart and how this caravan was uh, meaningful and uh, uh, critical experience for you. Yeah, I just, first of all, I want to appreciate you for uh, the introduction and I want to really extend just my deep appreciation to IFCO staff and your board of directors and um, for the invitation also to participate in this summation. 
of the, the 31st Friendship Mint Caravan. And I, I really, honestly, I feel very honored uh, to be able to join my fellow caravanistas to talk about this trip. And I think I feel fairly confident um, speaking on behalf of all of us who attended the trip when I say that this was an incredible, life-changing, transformative experience. Um, I joined the caravan as a part of a three-person contingent uh, representing our organization, the African People's Socialist Party, and our development arm, uh, the All African People's Development and Empowerment Project, as you mentioned in my introduction. Um, and the other members of our contingent included Comrade Fofit Alkibalan. Uh, she's a retired registered nurse with over 40 years of experience in nursing. And she serves as our APDEPS uh, medical volunteer coordinator. And she's the administra uh, administrator for our COVID-19 telehealth program. And also Comrade Chiwaniso Luzolo, who is our director of information and education. Um, we have, as an organization, we've, we've had a deep appreciation for IFCO's Cuba solidarity work and its related work as the coordinators of the Latin American School of Medicine Scholarship Program for US citizens. And um, we were really excited to be able to join the caravan so that we could learn about the realities of Cuban life and society and to connect with and learn from Cuban medical personnel, government officials and everyday citizens about the realities uh, in Cuba and about Cuba's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, which was incredibly important for us in our work. So, um, you know, in our work in the African People's Socialist Party and APDEP, our medical programs committee has been leading, as you mentioned, the People's War Commission against COVID-19, um, you know, summing it up with the help of our chairman, Omalia Shetela, as a colonial virus, uh, developing and distributing COVID-19 protocols uh, developing popular pamphlets and leaflets and taking them by the thousands to African working class communities throughout the US and in Africa, uh, building programs like our free international COVID-19 telehealth program that has since uh, mid 2020 been providing support to African and other people in various parts of the African world, including uh, people in Africa and Europe and the US um, uh, so we thought, you know, who better to learn from uh, to advance these kind of programs than the Cuban government and people. So, um, you know, that was really why we decided to come to Cuba, because we had to learn from the gains uh, of the Cuban revolution, particularly in the areas of health and just and specifically how they have managed to navigate fairly successfully uh, this COVID-19 pandemic. ASB, <laughs> how are you? world superpower were you watching the cuba thing have uh have failed oh i forgot about the cuba thing i'm not sure no, if y'all can hear um, that <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe angie can help us with me uh, oh my god oh my god, god. this is a good uh, moment to say anyone you know, who is not uh, oh so it's not just um no, yeah and, yeah and, it's, it's, uh, hey angie i think it's, it's Suzanne. Yes, yeah, Suzanne Ross. Thanks. All right, right on. Okay. <laughs> well, she was trying to organize people to the to the event, so thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, but really, you know, our our uh, our thought was that who better to learn from than Cuba? You know, from the Cuban people, from the Cuban government, from Cuban medical professionals, from Cuban scientists. And so really just to say that uh, my experience as a caravanista was impactful from the very beginning. Uh, we had two days of orientation in the US that helped us to get to know our fellow travelers and to begin having political discussions to help us to have some context, you know, through which we could filter our experiences on the ground in Cuba, which I think was really important. And, you know, I really, honestly, I was not expecting the incredible welcome that we received when we landed in Cuba. I mean, and I know that some of our Cuban comrades who greeted us off the plane were probably really confused when I reached out to hug, you know, all of them. They didn't know who I was, but I hugged everybody and it just seemed appropriate. And thankfully nobody, you know, turned away from my hugs. Um, but the first greeting was really just a glimpse um, into the warm hospitality that we would receive everywhere we traveled while we were in Cuba, including churches, community centers, community squares, from school children, government officials, community organizers, 
and everyday Cubans who we happen to meet on the streets. And I found the entire itinerary for our time in Cuba to be excellent. Um, as somebody who has read about and has a real deep appreciation for the Cuban revolution, but who had never traveled to Cuba, I feel really grateful to have been given the opportunity as a caravanista to learn firsthand about so many aspects of Cuban life. Uh, government and society. We met with women and youth organizations, artists, entrepreneurs, journalists, members of the faith community, LGBTQ organizers. We visited schools, hospitals, scientific institutions, community development projects, community centers, farms, and even had a chance to visit the Fidel Castro Museum before it officially opened to the public. Uh, and a private meeting with Cuban President Miguel Diaz Canal. I mean, that was just incredible. And personally, as a scientist and somebody who's worked for many years building healthcare and other uh, development programs for the African nation, two of the most impactful parts of our trip for me were when we met with members of the Cuban Henry Reeve Brigades in Matanzas and our visit to CIM, the Cuban Center for Molecular Immunology. Um, while at CIM, um, I personally, I became very emotional as I got to experience for the first time in my life and for more than uh, 20 years working as a, or as a physicist, what it really looks like when science is in the hands of the people, when it's being used to serve humanity and not being done for profit or to feed the imperialist war machine. And learning about and meeting some of the people who are responsible for Cuba's public health and scientific achievements made in the fight against COVID-19 was really inspiring. It reminded me why it is absolutely necessary for oppressed and colonized people and for the vast majority of the world's people to know the truth about Cuba, its revolution, and the incredible gains it has made to secure the health and well-being of the Cuban people. Um, and not only that, I think that the people of the world must know what Cuba has achieved is possible elsewhere. And that we as African people specifically must consolidate the African nation and advance the African internationalist struggle for a united socialist Africa as the only way that we'll be able to ensure that the vast wealth of our continent is used for the benefit of the masses of suffering African people everywhere. And I really believe that this trip, trip helped me to really understand that we must do what our Cuban comrades, brothers and sisters have already done and that is to make the African revolution. Um, before closing, I, I just really want to thank IFCO Pastors for Peace for organizing such a powerful and impactful experience. I wanna thank its director, uh, my sister, uh, Director Gail, uh, the caravan coordinator and just very always prepared uh, coordinator, John, um, Angie, you know, just the, the, the <laughs> the coordinator of all things, <laughs> very helpful. I just really appreciate that entire staff, the entire staff, the board of directors of IFCO for your committed leadership in the fight to win solidarity for Cuba and for your friendship, your camaraderie and your support in helping us as APTEP and, and the African People's Socialist Party to connect with our Cuban comrades on the ground to help us meet our organizational goals for the trip. So I really wanna appreciate you for that. We see that, we recognize and very much appreciate that. I wanna thank all of our Cuban hosts from the MLK Center, ECAP, and the other organizations and government agencies for their hospitality, their candor, their transparency, and above all, for your work to ensure that despite whatever obstacles you face, you continue to fight for your right and the right of the Cuban people as a whole for self-determination. And you continue to be an inspiration and please know that you are not alone. To my fellow caravanistas, I wanna say thank you for the many conversations, political struggles, we had many of those, late night walks, dance lessons, and even shit talking spades games that helped to make this trip a once in a lifetime experience. In a nutshell, this has been an incredible experience and it has really helped me to know that Cuba really is the light and we all have more work to do. Uhuru.
Oh my goodness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sis. I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, I know we're on this little Zoom call. What, what, what'd you say about those uh, space, space uh, talks? I think, I think Bobby knows about that. I think Bobby can speak on that in the Q&A, perhaps. He was the number one space partner. Everybody else was walking away from the table. I felt like I was kind of like, you know, at the uh, family reunion, you know, uh -huh. or, we're talking stuff. And I mean, those of you who don't know anything about card playing, you know, you had to sort of see some of our people out there, you know, throwing down cards and, and talking stuff. But uh, between that and playing dominoes and and just um, having conversation, I mean, that was one of the things that was really inspiring about the the caravan. Uh, not that we haven't done that before, but there was something very unique and special about this intergenerational conversation that took place. And whether that was over card playing or uh, or whatever it might be, uh, that people were engaged and, and trying to learn from one another and about the importance of this, this moment. Um, what it is that Cuba represents, uh, has to represent. Um, and um, I think the what what people brought to the table, the different caravanistas uh, brought to the table was important. Let me just ask you real quick before we go on to the next person. What was your experience, though, um, Aisha, when it came to talking about health care and what it is that you can actually think about bringing back to um, the communities here in the U.S.? I know we've talked about, you know, the desire to really um, look at Cuba's approach to healthcare and how it relates to the needs that are taking place in the United States. But based on your experience, your, your overall knowledge and then this caravan um, uh, experience, what, what, uh, what can you say about what it is that you brought back in terms of what your, your plans are about how to implement some of this on the ground in concrete ways? Miguel, I appreciate you for giving me a chance to speak to that. Um, I think you know, coming to Cuba, we were we had some specific goals associated with you know with the trip that we wanted to meet for the advancement of 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 the healthcare programs that we're involved with um, in the African People's Socialist Party, and we had discussions with you about that before and while we were in Cuba. And um, one of the things that we really wanted to be able to do was uh, learn from the Cuban model and see if we could make connections and potential commitments to have training that we could have uh, for the medical forces that we work with uh, around the question of how to uh, deal with um, emergency uh, medical situations, if there are natural disasters, if there are epidemics, pandemics. We know that Cuba has developed this, this incredible Henry Reeve Brigade that was initially developed to respond to the crisis that African people were experiencing in New Orleans um, during Hurricane Katrina, where the Cuban government offered a thousand doctors to come into the US and it was flatly rejected, even though we absolutely needed every one of those thousand medical professionals to come into New Orleans. The government allowed African people to drown. There was very little, you know, or, or poorly coordinated medical response to that. And Cuba was prepared to come and, and, and help, but the United States government would not allow that. And as African people and as uh, members of the African People's Socialist Party and APDEP, we've taken it upon ourselves to build something called Project Black Ankh, which is the African nation's response to the Red Cross. It's our ability to respond um, as African people when there are natural disasters and other kind of emergencies that impact African people around the world. And this is something that we've been developing since 2014 in response to the Ebola epidemic uh, in West Africa, where we've had incredible programs and where we did have some intervention um, you know, around the question of Ebola. So coming to Cuba for us was about attempting to advance our work to develop what Cuba has done um, similar to their Henry Reef Brigades. And we recognize that as African people, we have to have our own independent capacity, notwithstanding the friendship that Cuba has always given to Africa and to African people, but we can see it, they attempt, attempted to extend their friendship to us during Hurricane Katrina, but because we didn't have the power to say, yes, come, we couldn't assess that help. 
So our trip to Cuba is about making sure that no matter where we are as Black people, African people, anywhere in the world, we have our own ability to respond when those things happen. And so going to Cuba, uh, you know, making certain relationships and connections to attempt to secure that training, get getting access to Cuba's model for how to deal with those things is incredibly important. And I would I would hope, and I and I'm hopeful that it will make a, a, a serious impact in our ability to advance that work. So it's been incredible for us, Gail. No, absolutely. And and we learned from you. I mean, you know, you and 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 your uh, the, the sisters that came along uh, that were a part of the the exchange. You know, was so important. So I appreciate that. I really deeply appreciate that. I want to provide this as an opportunity for us to have an, an exchange. I mean, in many ways, I like to say the band is back together. Right. We had 72 different people that came together on this caravan and with all different um, um, perspectives. Uh, but we know each other. This, this is a, a family reunion in many ways. So I want to make sure that there's an opportunity as much as time allows for people to kind of plug in and interact with one another. So anybody who has questions as we move along, make sure to use, uh, make use of the chat uh, to uh, to put uh, comments and questions there and we'll try to do the best we can to monitor those and um, um, engage people as best possible. But moving on, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sister Aisha, I appreciate you. you. Thank you so and, much. And uh, appreciated uh, your, um, I, I learned a few things. I even got a few, you know, I tried a few dance steps, you know, along the way I'm, you know, yeah, work in progress, but moving on. Moving on. Let me just uh, grab uh, my brother, David, David Chung. David, who I've come to love and appreciate um, as a uh, incredible uh, part of the uh, team over at the uh, People's Forum, um, is an educator, community organizer. He's um, currently works at the, the, the People's Forum uh, in anti-imperialist and anti-capitalist, uh, internationalist, uh, political uh, Education and Cultural Center in, in New York. And many of us uh, in the New York area in particular have some knowledge of um, TPF and the, the great work that they've been doing. We were so excited to have David be a part, uh, David and others, uh, to be a part of um, the, uh, the team that came out of the TPF to be a part of um, this incredible um, Caravan. David first got involved with organizing in 2012 as an undocumented immigrant fighting for basic rights and human dignity, dignity and since then has gotten uh, to meet with and work with organizers from across the U.S. and internationally um, who are dedicated to transforming uh, the system that is at the root of problems that poor people face. Um, we know, we saw David, we were loving caravanning with David. David, every time I see that, that image of you on the caravan videos, it says, let's go! I get excited. I smile from ear to ear because your energy is infectious and your commitment in, uh, to, to justice is, is infected, infectious as well. So thanks for being here and just tell us what's on your heart. What do you feel as a caravanista? What was your experience? What can you tell us, my dear brother? about why uh, you think it's important for us to continue to do this work. Yeah, thank you so much, Gail. And, and thank you everyone for joining this call. Um, it's really good to see folks on a Friday. I've actually been having to quarantine over the past week uh, because I'm dealing with COVID right now. So um, Hi. it's good to, to see folks on Zoom. Um, I wanted to share kind of what brought me to go to Cuba. Uh, 2021 was a pretty intense year <clears throat> for a lot of different reasons, but the attacks on Cuba were intensifying. Um, and particularly during the summer, um, you all will probably have seen that there were uh, efforts by the US government to foment uh, discontent uh, among the Cuban population. Um, and as part of a coalition, the People's Forum had published an open letter to Joe Biden, um, at, like demanding and, and asking that um, the US government let Cuba live to end the blockade and the sanctions. And um, in response to that letter, we faced pretty heavy attacks. Um, at one point, 
during the summer, uh, we were holding a vendors market at the People's Forum, and there was a large protest that actually uh, materialized right outside of our space. Um, and they had waited until the end of the night um, as we were leaving. And they followed us um, all the way uh, for 10, 15 blocks down to Times Square um, and would not let us uh, go home safely. Um, and so these attacks continued, not uh, just in person, but online. Um, and, and so it was really important um, that we were very convicted, had the conviction of understanding what Cuba meant to us uh, and why the revolution uh, needed to be defended and protected. I also remember one of the last things that someone yelled at that the counter revolutionaries or what we call the gusanos yelled at me as they were leaving uh, or as we were trying to leave uh, was, um, if you uh, love Cuba so much, why don't you go there? Um, or have you ever been there? Um, and I thought, oh, if I, uh, that always stuck in my mind. And when the opportunity came where I could go with IFCO, I was like, oh, let's, let's do it. Let's, let's actually go and let's see uh, what's happening. Um, so I was really excited uh, when the opportunity materialized. Um, and, and so to go with, with uh, Pastors for Peace uh, caravan, it was really amazing. Um, there were uh, people that have been doing this work for uh, many years. There were a lot of young folks that were coming into this solidarity work, this anti-war movement, um, and wanted to learn more. One of the things that really stuck out to me was around the kind of media attacks that Cuba uh, has to face, um, in that there the media con constantly portrays Cuba as a country that uh, lacks freedom uh, or lacks human rights, lacks de democracy. Um, and yet we constantly saw throughout the caravan and throughout the trip, um, examples of, of there being freedom, there being democracy and there being uh, ample um, examples of human rights. We met with the union of uh, escritores um, y art artistas UNIAC um, and there were young people that were uh, very clear that they had the freedom of expression, that they could uh, express themselves culturally and artistically, um, but they were facing these constant barrages uh, by um, US forces on the accesses of capitalism, the accesses of um, kind of consumerism. Um, and, and so th their artistic kind of expressions had to come combat that. Um, we also, it was funny, we were in a church, we were physically in a church um, at the time that there were media attacks in the US saying that Cuba lacked uh, the freedom of religion. Um, there were churches all over the place and we were um, in houses of worship where people were able to express uh, themselves religiously. When we talk about democracy, it's funny, um, just yesterday in the US, um, the uh, the U.S. Senate actually was not able to uh, push forward me measures uh, that would allow for the filibuster uh, to expand uh, voting rights or to go past the filibuster and expand voting rights. Um, and so, how can the U.S. say anything about democracy? Uh, but in the in, in Cuba, that we were there at a time when they were uh, discussing expanding the family code within the constitution. And what does it mean to be part of a family? Uh, it, it's for um, up to 40, for almost 47 years, the family code had not been updated. Uh, and so there were talks about what does it mean to be an untraditional family? What does it mean to have a family where it could be a brother and, uh, um, and taking care of their siblings? What can it be uh, when it's a same-sex couple? All of these uh, different types of traditional, uh, untraditional families and bringing them up to the level of tra uh, traditional families. Um, talking about what it means to adopt, um, and so we realized that eight, over 8 million people had been involved in these discussions around the family code. Uh, 1 million people had proposed changes. Uh, so this is what it means when, it, when we're talking about democracy, of getting all, all people involved. Um, and then lastly, when these attacks around human rights and saying Cuba has no human rights, uh, we saw complete opposite of that. We saw that there were uh, healthcare, hum, um, the, human right around facing hunger 
and housing. Uh, Cuba con is constantly focused on making sure people and working people have access to those things. Um, and uh, we also talk about education. Um, in, in the US, uh, education is, is constantly being defunded, public education is being defunded, uh, but education is something that is held very dear in Cuban society. Um, and so people are encouraged to follow um, and take part in education and, and learn and take part in careers that will further um, and improve society. And so we're seeing all of these examples and we realize that everything that we're taught here in the US about Cuba and about poor countries, about poor people uh, is completely backwards. Um, and so I, I, I'm, I wanted to kind of bring that back and that we, I learned so much during this trip. I'm really excited that there are going to be other young people that will have the opportunity to learn from uh, Cuban people, learn from Cuban society, I mean, encouraged to like bring more young people in the upcoming year, learn from what's happening. And, and lastly, um, we one of the first places we went to was a denunciation museum. And we learned all of the attacks that the US does on, on Cuba. Um, and we asked the tour, uh, the woman that was giving us the tour, how does she feel knowing that we are, are people coming from the US, but the US has done so much harm to Cuba. And, and she was very clear that it, it is not the poor people, it is not the working people that are causing these harm uh, to Cuba, it is the government of the US. And so it is our duty as people of conscience, of people that know what our, our government is doing to expose this and, and make sure that we are pushing back and, and, and make sure that the government ends this blockade, this inhumane blockade. So ex so excited. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Uh, I'm excited to um, answer any questions and also um, hopefully brought, you know, all of the experiences, all the energy that uh, I experienced there uh, into this webinar. Yeah, thank you, Dave, thank David. Thank you so much, and 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 hoping you to have a swift and uh, healthy recovery. I hate hearing that more and more and more people that I know um, have been impacted by COVID directly. Um, and you, you're one, and I hope that you continue to to heal. I just wanted to say thanks so much for for all of the, what you shared. You know, one of the things that I think about you, David, I think about your passion about um, housing. Um, you, um, the People's Forum, right there in Midtown Manhattan. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of houselessness, homelessness that we see uh, that it, that's happening there. That that folk are, uh, you know, forced to to grapple with. How did your uh, and I know that you've been a passionate advocate and speaking out about the. Um, uh, the impact of, um, you know, policies that impact people's ability to live, live in, in their own homes. How did your experience in Cuba, I mean, and what you saw, you know, how does that relate to what it is that you experience on the day to day by being there um, um, in the community of uh, the People's Forum? Yeah, thank you so much, Gail. I think when we talk about housing, we ultimately have to go to the root and, and the source of the problem and that in the US, housing is seen as a commodity, a uh, com commodity for profit. And ultimately the reforms that are proposed by uh, the government are, are half solutions. Are, um, for example, during the pandemic, people, uh, houses people were put up in hotels, uh, but this was somewhat of a kind of, um, a, a giveaway to the hotels because the hotels were actually struggling to uh, make it their ends meet. Um, and, and then right as the tourists came back into New York City, uh, the houseless people were actually put back into shelters, shelters that were unsafe. Um, in, in Cuba, housing is not, a, is not a commodity and it's seen as a, a human right, um, a, a, um, a right that people are entitled to and need. And so when uh, we talk about it, it's systemic. And so ultimately what we are going to need is a working class revolution in the US. We need uh, a, a government and, and uh, working class people to take power so that we can 
uh, give people, we can make sure that everyone has uh, decent housing, housing that meets their needs. Um, and then not only does that, but uh, get and empowers people to improve their neighborhoods, improve their uh, cities that they're living in. Uh, because right now it, this doesn't exist and it's ultimately systemic. And so uh, that's something that definitely resonated. Excellent. Thanks, David. Thank you so much. And again, please continue to heal and uh, get better. I, um, I'm saddened by so many of our family, our extended families that's been uh, forced to deal with COVID, but be well. Um, maybe this is a perfect segue to talk to our dear friend, Mark, Mark Ginsburg, who was a retired in 2016 from um, FH 1360, uh, an international um, NGO, um, is living uh, a visiting scholar at the U University of Maryland, um, was a faculty member at other universities, including the, the Universidad de Ciencias uh, uh, the Pedagogical uh, University um, in uh, Cuba, Enrique Jose Verona. And Mark has traveled to Cuba. Um, more than 15 times since 1993, including participating, thankfully, in the earlier uh, caravans to Cuba, organized by Pastors for Peace, the French Shipman Caravans, both in 1993 and 2021, um, as well as international solidarity conferences, sister city trips. Um, done a lot of work um, with the Pittsburgh Matanzas sister city uh, relationship. Um, and so there's more that we can say, but I know, I mean, the, the, the bottom line is that, Mark, you've been really a stalwart in the area of, um, of Cuba solidarity. So um, we were excited. I was excited to see you, you know, being able to participate in this uh, year's caravan and um, curious what your um, feelings and thoughts and perspectives were uh, being back in Cuba. This was the first time you were in Cuba since when? Since? 2019. Wow, so 2019, okay, yeah. So um, what was your experience like? I mean, I wanna talk a little bit to you about, I wanna hear from you directly, but then talk a little bit about the, your, your opinions, particularly as it relates to Cuba's approach to the, the vaccines. I know you've been really engaged in the Saving Lives campaign of the, uh, the um, US Cuba Normalization Committee. Um, but yeah, talk a little bit about what your experience was being back in Cuba after a few years and what it meant to be on this caravan with uh, all these young activists. Yes, th thanks very much, Gail. Uh, for me, it's always a, uh, uh, a source of, of energy and inspiration to return to Cuba. But I have to admit, going on, going on this, uh, sorry, going on this caravan with the uh, incredible group of caravanistas that were part of it made this even more uh, memorable and more, more, more inspiring. Um, my first time in Cuba was in 1993 with uh, um, uh, IFCO, Pastors for Peace. And in fact, the, the two gentlemen who are pictured behind me, uh, Lucius and, and Fidel, I met them uh, in night for the first time in 1992. And uh, although I had been inspired by their lives and activities before that, that was the first first time. But um, 1993, of course, was in the context of Cuba's uh, special period. And to some extent, um, being there and being told by friends and others that um, uh, Cuba was experiencing something even worse than a special period. To tell you the truth, I was uh, um, perplexed when I arrived in Havana and saw so many vehicles on the roads. Uh, in 1993, um, you know, it, you, you had to wait forever to, to see a bus and private cars, et cetera. So in some ways, that aspect of, of the uh, um, economic crisis that Cuba is experiencing what wasn't visible. But it's very clear that the, pand that the pandemic, but even maybe more so, 
the uh, continuing blockade um, has a enormous impact on daily life and on the activities of Cuba. I'll just give a few examples. Uh, I also uh, had a chance to visit the Center for Molecular Immunology. And we heard as in that um, institution, but also in others about the, about the uh, incredible accomplishments that Cuba has had in terms of uh, developing and, 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 and putting into arms um, three different uh, successful, very successful 90% 90, 90 plus vaccines. Um, but at the same time, we heard how difficult it was to get the basic um, chemicals and ingredients that, that are needed to, to produce those because of the, the blockade and because of the complications of, of uh, uh, companies that would or would not trade, trade, trade with, with Cuba. And we also heard about how um, difficult uh, Cuba was finding to, to engage in the international solidarity with its vaccines, in part because it didn't have the ingredients to, to produce as much, but also because the US was um, uh, uh, trying to convince various countries that um, even the medical solidarity, the, the Henry Reeves Brigade was, uh, you know, some form of slavery and, and they shouldn't allow the uh, Cubans to come to, 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 to that country. But at the same time, um, uh, we heard similar message about the difficulty of getting um, basic components, uh, visited an industrial uh, company uh, that was assembling electronic uh, devices um, uh, named after uh, Camilo Sanfuegos. And again, it was clear they could have been a much um, bigger operation and, and producing a lot of things that were needed in, in Cuba, but they couldn't get some of the, some of the components. And on a more personal level, uh, given that I've lived in Cuba for extended periods as a visiting professor, um, I had a chance to meet with uh, the woman who was uh, um, the owner of the house where I had a uh, rented a room. And she informed me how uh, she'd been waiting for a year to have surgery on uh, an intestinal problem that she has because uh, Cuba hasn't been able to get the anesthetic and, and, and some of the uh, basic needs to, to do it so that uh, her surgery is not as high priority as others and so she's waiting. But to, I know uh, from her and just looking at her, this is not something that was pleasant to, to, be, to, to be enduring. But at the same time, Cuba seemed to me to uh, exemplify resilience. Um, when we visited the hospital in Cardenas, which was kind of the center of, of, uh, of, of, of the coronavirus last, last year and, and, and uh, really stretched to the, to, to, to the brim, as in many hospitals uh, in the US and elsewhere around the world. But when we had reports from, from the doctors and, and in talking to some of the nurses uh, there, um, it, was, it was just um, so um, uh, special to hear not only how they dealt with this big challenge, but how they've continued uh, to, to devote themselves to the healthcare of, of those in, in, uh, in the province of Matanzas, where, where, which is where Cardenas is, 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 is located. And also the, the resilience was exemplified to me by um, some of the communities that we visited, both in, in uh, the province of Havana, but also in, in the province of, of, of Matanzas. I remember in particular being inspired by the people in, in a uh, uh, area called Timba, and, and how they were working to address uh, basic community needs and individual housing needs. Um, again, it to me shows that 
uh, it's not just a, a, a national plan, it's also local initiative, uh, collaboration of religious groups and political groups and, 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 the, and, and the government. As I said at the beginning, um, this trip for me, um, all I had to do is land in Havana and, uh, and, and have my energy level um, uh, uh, raised enormously. But given the great people who I met, and some of whom I didn't get to meet as much as, as I'd like and get to know as well, I'm looking forward to that in the future, uh, helped me when I came back to resume some of the activities I'm involved in, particularly uh, in the Saving Lives campaign. I'm quite active now that I live in Santa Cruz. They've uh, uh, Friends have graciously allowed Santa Cruz to be part of the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area Saving Lives Committee and involved in, in, in webinars and caravans and, and rallies. We participate in the national efforts to um, uh, uh, to ship 6 million syringes to Cuba. Again, because of the embargo, they have the vaccine, but couldn't uh, easily purchase um, the, the, the syringes. PPE, uh, protective equipment also being said. And, and currently the efforts in Project El Pan, which is an, is an effort spearheaded by um, Cuban Americans and supported by a variety of different groups to provide um, another thing that is definitely um, not easy to get in Cuba as it should be, um, uh, that is food. Uh, again, the, 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 the blockade is, um, uh, affects people everyday life. I talked to some of my friends who, um, who, who mentioned how they, um, sometimes couldn't find things that they normally would like to purchase for, for their meals. And if they could purchase them, they ended up waiting in line. And again, part of this, there, there are a number of factors, but I would identify the blockade as, as a big one, which has created um, enormous uh, challenges to get um, uh, what, what should be available uh, and, and has historically been available in, to every household. So maybe I'll leave it at that and I can respond to any questions and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, from, from the other caravanistas. Mark, thanks so much. And yeah, a lot of really good, important and salient points that um, are a part of the, the, the continuing conversation. So just thanks, thanks for being here and they always, um, it's been a pleasure to always be able to caravan with you. So that's good. Listen, we have to switch gears a little bit. We have somebody on the line, actually a special guest from Puerto Rico. My sister, I, um, Kyla uh, Pauli, Paulino. Those of you who were on the uh, report back, not the report back, but the send off um, uh, program saw and got a chance to hear some spoken word uh, from uh, my sister, uh, Kyla. I just wanna say real quickly, cause I know she's got a, a short amount of time. Um, do we have, there she is, there she is, thank you. Hello. Thank you, thank you, my sister. She's a longtime friend of Cuba. Um, and of course, IFCO Pastors for Peace, um, friend shipment caravans has uh, traveled um, on her first friend shipment uh, caravan when you were just 15 years old, a little baby, um, has been a route speaker and uh, been on the um, a part of the P for P uh, community for many years. Uh, learned a lot from the legacy of, of our dear departed Lucius Walker. Um, I'm really grateful for you to take, I know you're busy, but you said you would be willing to jump on the phone, maybe give us a little uh, words of inspiration from afar. Um, and I just want to stop talking and let you do that. And thank you so much, sis, for doing this for us. Thank you, Gail. Thank you. It's always um, a pleasure and an honor to be, it's really an honor and a privilege to you know, continue to be a part of the If Go Passes for Peace family. And um, as Gail mentioned that my first caravan was when I was 15 and um, just, you know, loved and learned so much from the legacy of, of um, Revolution Walker. And um, yeah, just, you know, 
freedom is never free, right? And people have been fighting for so long in order to, to be able to be sovereign um, and not have to bend to imperialism, right? So right now I'm on the island of Borinque in Puerto Rico and we are experiencing deep colonialism apart from having always been this com commonwealth basically colony. Right now with the pandemic, many people are moving here and the, the land is up for sale, but Boricuas don't have the money to buy it, right? So we understand and Cuba always understood and and IFCO understands that this is really internationalist, that we, we get free by supporting liberation movements internationally. Today we're mourning um, a plenero, Tito Matos, who passed away and he was huge. But the reason that he was huge is because he also understood that, that when we, no matter where we are, right? Anywhere in the world that we may be, we have these struggles that we go through. And sometimes you're going through so much just where you are, but it doesn't mean that that struggle is different or, you know, not to call it, it's not that every struggle is the same, but this, we have so many intersections of our life, you know, and that we can support and love each other. So, yeah, I guess I just, um, I want to start with this chant that I've just been singing a lot because I want us to always remember that we are free. So this is a chant that I've just been chanting in my head a lot. And I want to share this one with you. And then I'll go into a poem about freedom from the perspective of a young person living in New York, dealing with oppression, not even, you know. So this one goes, freedom, 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 liberation del amor. Liberation del amor. Liberté, 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 liberté. L'union fait la force, l'union fait la force. Fuerza y unión. Un solo corazón, fuerza y unión, un corazón. Freedom, 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 freedom. Free, free, free is to dance like Shango que al Caribe llegó from Mama Africa where he's king of Oyo to plantations where he still shines though. And all who see him know that what he has is greater than oppression. Free spirits break chains, can't take repression. Balance fire with sweet waters, honey like Oshun. Conviction stands firm like tickled pickles on honeymoons. Night walk guarded, daylight greatness started. From us, dearly never departed. Distance connected, we're loving wholehearted. Hood enough to know ghetto was always good enough. Not synonymous with the short change they give us. So we distrust, proven loyalty a must. We've been through so much with the crew. If we were copper, we'd been rust. Watching how they steal all sacred, even get at the earth's crust. But stronger we would remain, so we myth bust. Free your mind, love man will man free the land. Break through prison walls, anointed with the fierceness of Asada's hands. They hate to love, love to hate us, but our communities can't disband. Day to day, off plantations wane. Fuck Uncle Sam and Uncle Tom and his children too. We build wigwams and cop homes, dream of mountains like maroons, squat homes and claim dignity. Their bullshit freedom was never free. Chase Bank, Chase and Frank, Maria Pedro and Amadou. Abolish slavery, no prison pipeline when we're through. Imagine all you could be if you knew you. It's the reasons why they teach you them to keep you stuck in slave blues. Black story, your story, my story, his story, her story, our story, true story. Ask Lucy if she could speak, she'd disown all the devil children that looked unlike her own and spat on her legacy. We're so Harlem, our souls Harlem. East side to west, straight respect, blessed doctrine. Black brown unity, viva Puerto Rico free, NDR and IET, and all held in captivity. Like a panther cage, released and still fighting to the grave, say cool. Like the X replacing the literal in our great hero's name. Like Mumia's consciousness, they can't tame. Like the revocation of the lie that we're nothing, we know they're lame. Reasons why they make, they must take, try to replicate, but never the same. Like Baldwin's pen and Audre Lorde's scriptures, 
like men raised by mothers abandoned by many mistresses, having to navigate life on both sides like a jester because they tried to keep her from the light so she learned black magic. Test her. We're torn between the truth in Dr. John Henry Clark and the truth in his remark that we've got enough mileage out of marching, but you're still a protester because every time they lynch another, our feet and souls are covered with remnants of blood and tarred feathers, pain fermenting prejudice like fuck John and Heather because they never had to brave the cold without a sweater and always live better. Never had a cow, but always had cheddar. We angry at Ramona Africa's burn marks, remembering how they bombed in on fire setta. Our heroes don't just rock shows, they clock bigots and racist popo. We're all to make the rose and pox bros when the Panther Cubs uprose and took heat to the street for our people to be free. Lions searching for lionesses like Sophia Bukhari, who can't stand to see us suffering without feeling unrest and fought tirelessly holding, uh, holding grace in the face of life's stress. Know that winter's always cold, but more quickly froze the bird that didn't build its nest. And though we cannot change the world alone, we must do our part and leave more cushion for the rest. Learn your beauty, love your light. Know that white was never right. They just told a bigger lie. Stolen, sold, fallacies contrived. And life is always better by our people's side. So it's time to rise a different tide and love all those. Love all those. Love every single which one those, every color those, every gender those. And we create those that for freedom ride. Thank you, sister. Thank you. You know, freedom, freedom, freedom. When you, you know, those that, that, that so that resonates, right? That resonates throughout um, all of the work that we do. Um, freedom, love, freedom. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. I know that you are in the midst of. Um, you know, mourning um, and, and and trying to, you know, really bring uh, a level of uh, love and spirituality to, to, to the place where you are and to the, the community there. And just thank you. And thanks for taking a moment out to just um, share with us and to share these important words. Appreciate you. Uh-oh, you're, you're muted, you're muted. I was just saying, thank you. For, for, you know, including me and also thank everybody that's on the call for caring about freedom and for putting, you know, your your spirit, your bodies, your resources in together, you know, to continue to support liberation movements in the world, you know, and that poem that I wrote, I, the, I only share it because it's not, see, for me, it's really about all of us support freedom. Anyone who has freedom in our heart and love in our heart and care about each other, that is what we continue to rise to every day, right? So it's not about a color, it's not about any of that. It's about the, the anger sometimes that the people feel. It's like the injustice that has been done so much to our people and how we fight for that. But we are all together making new worlds and those new worlds will be worlds of more love and of more support and more solidarity and more justice because we come together. And I'm so grateful to you, Gail, for, for reaching out. And I'm grateful to your father and his legacy. And I'm grateful to see John on the call for all these years. John, you've been holding it down. And I'm just grateful to be a, a part of the Info community. So thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. John, are you with us? John Waller? Before... I am, yes. All right. I just wanted to to bring you in super, super quick, just uh, since uh, uh, Kayla had, had mentioned you. And uh, of course, there's this long, tremendous history that John Waller has, you know, kind of always brought to this um, to this work. Um, I wanted to just uh, just thank you, Kayla, for, for your time and energy. I know you've got to step off. John just wanted to give you a quick moment to maybe just talk about uh, uh, briefly why you thought you know this caravan. What did it was it about this caravan that was so special and important, and what it is that's going to you know and um, and just I don't know kind of continue to lift us up as we the old heads. John, I'm getting it. You know, I'm getting more and more gray. Like I'm not as bald as gray as as, as John just said, but. Uh, what is it, you know, that, you know, this is, I mean, in many ways, this is inspiring for those of us who've been doing this work for some time. I'm going to grab Mark and I'm going to grab uh, 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 Cheryl and when I, when I say those things, those old heads, what is it, you know, that you think was inspiring and, and important about this caravan? Yeah, it's 
interesting, I was speaking, uh, the previous speaker was Mark, and Mark and I were a very atypical caravanistas this time, because the caravan, 60 people in the caravan had never been on a caravan. More than half the caravan had never, sorry, more than half the caravan had never been to Cuba before. 50% um, people of color, many young people, a clear majority of women. And I also want to point out that traditionally caravans have been mainly people from the Northeast, from the Pacific coast, from the big cities of the North. This was a caravan with a lot of people from the South of the United States. That was the first time I've ever experienced that. That was important. Um, and it was a really serious group of people. I mean, people who knew how to party, knew how to, play, knew how to dance, there's plenty of dancing, but serious committed political activists. And they were responding to the way Cuba treated us. A really impressive range of speakers who spoke. Two hours with the president of Cuba, Miguel Diaz Canal. Two hours. Who gets that? We were the first group, the first group to visit before it even opened the Fidel Castro Museum, an incredible museum. For those of you who've been to Cuba before but haven't been recently, I absolute must you must visit that museum. It's so powerful. Yeah. Um, I could go say more, I won't. But my final comments, knowing that maybe 30% of the caravanistas are on this call, the real test is not what you've done so far. The real test is what's to come. The solidarity work you're going to be doing, the way you're going to be linking, as some of you I know already are, Cuba into your struggles in the US. And when I'm there in Havana in July 2022, and I'm asking people, how did you learn here about the caravan? They're all going to be saying, oh, Salifu told me, or Mark told me, or Aisha told me, or all the other caravanistas told me. That's the challenge. I'll stop there. Excellent, excellent, John. Yeah, it, 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 you know, hearing from those who uh, traveled before, encouraging others to go, uh, so important. Um, just want to move on because I know time is running short and we've got a, a couple of caravanistas that I, it's really important for folks to hear from. But Lone, Lone, I want to bring you forward. Lone Tran is an organizer and writer based in Durham, North Carolina, um, um, focused on um, migrant justice, LGBTQ issues, uh, youth, student organizing. Um, just a generally wonderful person who was really engaged in this caravan and I, I'm, I'm telling you to get on this Cuba thing and I, I can't get the sound. I see them, but I can't. Get I don't know what happened to Gail. Yeah, you're on mute. Somehow I got muted. Yeah, you're muted. Angie must have muted me. So Angie's fault. Anyway, um, but Lone, uh, Lone Tran, um, who was a member of the uh, the uh, the caravan, a member of the Durham branch of the Workers World Party, um, just an overall wonderful person on the caravan. Just wanted to talk about and uh, to bring you into this and ask you to share with us your thoughts. Uh, about this caravan, why it was significant, and why we need to continue to bring new people and to, to have this experience. Uh, so just feel free, floor is yours. Well, thank you, Gail, for the introduction. And thank you to uh, Aisha and David and Mark and Kayla who shared before me. And folks have obviously really wonderful reflections um, to share. So I am really grateful to be a part of this conversation um, and really especially want to, you know, just reiterate all of the gratitude for IFCO, uh, Pastors for Peace, for all of the organizing work that y'all have done, have been doing um, for many, many years to connect, uh, in particular, the people of the United States with the Cuban people, um, so that all of us can see and experience firsthand for ourselves, um, you know, what is actually happening in Cuba and how that can be part of um, our models um, and struggles for, for justice, especially here in the United States. Um, you know, when I start thinking about Cuba, my mind just, it runs at like 100 miles an hour, because uh, there's, there's so much to say. 
Um, and a lot of that has already, again, been beautifully shared tonight. And, and as John just shared, um, as you know, the wonderful caravan coordinator and organizer, um, that much of the rest of that will have to be expressed through our ongoing solidarity work with Cuba, right? That That is how we're gonna see um, a lot of these observations and reflections going forward. Um, but where I wanna start is actually, you know, um, uh, in the year 1961, Cuba was actually the first nation uh, to recognize the National Front uh, uh, for the Liberation of South Vietnam um, in, in that very long struggle um, to defeat the U.S. empire. Uh, and that solidarity has continued now for, for over 60 years with uh, one of the most recent expressions um, being the arrival of the Abdullah uh, COVID-19 vaccine created by Cuba, even under some really horrendous um, circumstances, primarily the, the US blockade against Cuba, right? So for, for over 60 years, uh, Cuba has been a part of um, an international struggle as Kayla and other folks have uh, already spoken to. Um, and I start there, you know, because as an organizer um, in the US South, I come from a immigrant family, I come from a family that, um, you know, migrated from Vietnam as, as a direct result of US imperialism and war. And so I know really intimately and really personally that violence, right, the physical violence of war and borders and, and family separation. But there's also a real, you know, psychic violence, um, all of the attempts to erase um, and misconstrue the essence and the spirit of a people. Uh, and if you look back at any of the US propaganda um, from that period of time, um, with all of the mounting attacks um, uh, from the US on Vietnam, a big part of that campaign and a big part of that story was well, the Vietnamese, you know, they're just they're just backwards and they're and they're stupid, you know, and they're they're just these weirdo communists out on this, you know, in Southeast Asia. And um, and there's this real story um, that uh, that Vietnamese people, that my people just didn't know what we were fighting for, didn't know uh, what it is that we believed in. Um, and well, we know exactly how that ended, right, for the United States, <laughs> that in fact, the Vietnamese are not stupid. Um, and I think, you know, David spoke to this earlier, but, you know, the intensifying attacks uh, on Cuba in, in more recent years, um, uh, not to mention for many decades, it, it, it's a very similar story that is being told about Cuba, right? That the Cubans just don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're talking about, that, you know, this island nation in the Caribbean of 11 million people, you know, they're just all doing this make-believe socialist thing. Um, and again, right, the United States time and time again is, is being disproved of, of just that arrogance, um, of that, uh, you know, U.S. centrism, um, of, uh, of that imperialist and colonial mindset um, that says any other uh, uh, system, economic system, political system, social system, um, you know, just simply can't compare to, to capitalism in the United States. And, and again, we see where that has led, um, you know, the, the, the millions and millions of workers and oppressed people here during the pandemic, um, during an uh, increasing, you know, economic crisis, political crisis, state violence, and so on and so forth. Um, and so for me, you know, going to Cuba was just a really beautiful reminder of uh, what it looks like to struggle and, and you know, and to win. Right, and to really, really fight for what you believe in, despite all of the, um, the, the real physical, literal, um, as well as psychic attacks um, on, on your struggles and on your people. And, and that those struggles can be really scary um, to go up against empire, uh, but that can't stop you. Because <laughs> uh, you know, I think on the theme of what folks have shared before, being unfree is probably the most terrifying thing in the context of, of all that we have to do and of all of the struggles that we um, have to, to, to wage. Uh, you know, When we visited the Fidel Castro Center, uh, I shared there that in Vietnamese solidarity is um, it's two words, it's uh, nghĩa, uh, which loosely translates to love and integrity. Um, it's a solidarity in many ways is to love with integrity, 
right? That we love people, we trust people, we build with people, um, and we maintain a deep integrity about, uh, you know, um, as, as uh, Dr. King and many other freedom fighters have said, the arc of justice, right? The arc of history, wh where does it point, right? We remain, you know, really clear and steadfast in that. Um, and, and that, that loving with integrity is what Cuba has done for Vietnam for, for very long. Uh, that's what Cuba has done for oppressed people all around the world. That's what Cuba has done for working class people in the United States, even though there is so much propaganda out there, um, constantly um, uh, nagging at our consciousness um, about what exactly is happening in Cuba. And of course, um, that love and integrity is what Cuba has done for its own people uh, and the, you know, and the Cuban revolution and its ongoing revolution um, is, a, is a prime example of that. Um, you know, I appreciate the shout out from John about representation from the US South and my challenge to um, anyone who is going to be participating in upcoming caravans is to uh, bring delegations from your region that are bigger than the delegations that the South will be bringing, I'm sure, for many years to come. I've been talking to as many people as I possibly can and, and really grateful that the, the um, group that I was able to travel with as part of this delegation um, were, you know, nearly 15 people um, from North Carolina and Virginia representing prison struggles, representing labor organizing, um, representing food justice organizing, representing all kinds of work. Um, and, and that's really needed. Uh, and I think I want to especially, you know, speak more to that piece of what it means to build this um, uh, South to South struggle, right? That in the US South, we are a part of a, a global South um, that has a very long history of struggling against racism, struggling against the banks and struggling against the bosses. And we also know in this context how difficult it is to forge solidarity uh, among our class for a number of reasons, divisive politicians, um, propaganda, uh, crumbling infrastructure, uh, labor exploitation, um, it it's, can be very challenging. Um, but it's really necessary. And, and from my firsthand experience, um, you know, I think that uh, we have a very also strong legacy of, of building a way out of no way. And being in Cuba was just such a great reminder of that as well, learning about the work of the new family code, that so much of that was about building alliances across different sectors of society. I went to church more times than I have in a very long time traveling with IFCO, and I am really grateful for that because uh, that's exactly how it happens in the U.S. South. You meet in churches, you meet in fellowship halls. Uh, faith is defined as a um, struggle and organizing for justice and for liberation and for freedom, um, and so it was just amazing to experience that firsthand, um, to know that, um, you know, whether you are um, a, a faith leader in Cuba or an LGBTQ person or both, um, that there is this shared understanding that in order uh, for us to live in a society that is truly defined by um, our shared humanity and dignity, we got to do some difficult work that's going to take some time and we have to keep working at it, right? Then it is not um, immediate by any measure of the word. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll start wrapping up soon, but one of the things that I wanted to, to, to sort of end on um, that another person, David, has already raised, but I think it's important to just reiterate, the, the popular consultation process um, for the new family code engaged 8 million Cubans. Um, and again, Cuba is an island nation of 11 million people. J just like, <laughs> can you imagine that, <laughs> right? That is actually democracy, right? That is actually, um, uh, people are uh, in, regular people are actually in real ownership um, of their destiny and of their lives. Um, and there is a real public dialogue um, that shapes people's realities in Cuba in a way that we are fighting for and striving for here in the United States every single day. Um, and so, you know, folks have said it before, and I just wanna say it again, it, Cuba is, is not perfect. And there is a lot that we could say about that. There's all kinds of um, conversations and details that we could get into. But I, I want to end by saying that you know, Cuba doesn't have to be perfect because um, Cuba is socialist, Cuba is democratic, uh, and Cuba is humane. Uh, and I think 
all three of those things uh, surpass this expectation to um, be perfect by by every sort of aspect of the imagination. So uh, thank you again, um, uh, Gail and John and Angie and the entire IFCO uh, team and family for, the, for this opportunity to, to just share a tiny piece of, of my experience in, in Cuba. Thank you, Lone, so much. And, and you know, you said so many key points, but yeah, and Cuba's not perfect. We know the U.S. is imperfect, which is why we continue to do the work that we do. Um, and I think it's important, you know, there are some people who say, well, why, do, why is it that you feel it's important to lift up the fact that Cuba's not perfect? Because we're not just clanging the, you know, the bell of, you know, perfection here. We're just saying that this is an example and that there are a lot of different um, experiences that we learned from our trips to Cuba about Cuba's approach to dealing with some of these difficult issues. And you just really highlighted, I think in many ways, a lot of them. Um, but thank you, Lon. Thanks for just being you and being on the trip and it was great. And we have more to talk about. So I'm gonna keep clamoring to get a hold of you. I wanna quickly move over to Shaquille. Um, Shaquille, um, I'm gonna Shaquille, I'm gonna try not to butcher your last name. Fontenot. I think I perfect. Okay, very okay, good. I like that. Perfection. Um, I know um, um, Shaquille, who goes by um, she, they, they, them, is an anti-imperialist uh, communications um, worker, a uh, specialist, an educator, cultural worker. Um, has served as chief strategy officer of the Cedar Wolf Media Project, a media production company that is also co-founded by Low Country Action Com Committee, Low Action Committee, a Black-led organization um, that uh, uh, is dedicated to Black liberation through service, political education, and collective action. Um, in the low country of South Carolina. Low Action uh, Community is also a member of uh, the NNOC, uh, the National Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression, as well as the People's Budget Coalition and the Black and Hispanic Coalition. And Shaquille has been in, uh, been engaged uh, in organizing around racial, justice, workers' rights, and food equity, and over the past uh, decade um, has headed the media um, committee, has been a, a member of the media committee of the NNOC, National Network on Cuba. So thanks, Shaquille, for being here. Thanks for being you. Thanks for just being the bright light that you are. Shaquille was very engaged in some of the organizing and um, educational and um, informational organizing that was connected to the last caravan. And I was grateful to get a chance to work with you more closely, gotten a chance to connect with you through NNOC. Um, but we're grateful for you being here and wanna hear what your thoughts are uh, in general about the caravan experience that you had. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, IFCO team. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here this evening with you all. Um, I wanted to really speak about kind of some of the contradictions that exist in the United States, and they really became even more glaring after um, my experience in visiting Cuba. And what I've noticed in the time that I have been organizing is that a tactic of imperialism is to water down the reality of the experience of the people. So we hear these conversations that there's no religious freedom in Cuba, there's no artistic freedom, um, so many other things. And prior to going to Cuba, I was aware of many of the U.S.'s tactics to circumvent the actions of the revolution. So an example is the US Agency for Global Media, which has an office of Cuba Broadcasting headquartered in Miami, and they have an annual budget of about $30 million. There's also uh, funding specifically directed towards supporting US imperialism in Cuba through infiltration of social media, um, infiltration of the consciousness of the youth through various tactics, and even using um, an economic blockade to make 
the population doubt the efficacy of the revolution. And earlier today, I saw a message that was a clear example of the harsh realities of living under an imperialist empire. And it said, you look up and realize that you've been skillfully indoctrinated into believing you're part of an empire that was actually forced on you through violence. You are not the empire or part of the empire. You are among the natural resources being extracted by the empire. And in Cuba, the people were not being used by the nation. They were and are the nation. And this was evidenced through the continued development of workers' rights and unions, LGBTQ plus rights, family and women's rights, and even special programs to help reintegrate people into society after incarceration. And in Cuba, I felt and, and learned and saw that the priority was placed on the needs of the people and the longevity of the revolution. And you can only sustain a revolution by sustaining the material needs of the people and by sustaining the ideology that gave way for that revolutionary process. So one of the examples of like the value of um, the value placed on human life in Cuba came from a group of doctors outside the province of Matanzas, and they talked about all the, the stressors that they experienced during the height of the pandemic and their mindset, in addition to the structure of the medical system in Cuba, was completely different from the profit-driven practices that don't put community care at the forefront here in the United States. They also spoke about doctors on every block in every province dedicated to preventative health care, meaning they aim to curb ailments and diseases before they even happen. And it's free. Meanwhile, we're here begging for four COVID tests and they're attached to having a home while we have half a million people unhoused. So I read about the benefits of the revolution and I worked with the NNOC previously. I read Isaac Sandy's book, Revolution in Motion and watched a bunch of Fidel speeches. And then even when we got to Cuba, Gloria was teaching us about Antonio Maceo and the structure of the revolution. But I wanted to see it for myself. And so now that I've seen it, I can't unsee it. So in terms of how we bring this back to our own collective struggles in the United States, we're conscious of the fact that the systems of the imperialist empire of the United States are extremely ineffective and reactive. Whereas in Cuba, the focus is on proactive maintenance and um, strengthening of the people despite a lack of access to resources due to the longest standing blockade in modern history imposed by the United States. So from an educational standpoint, the focus in Cuba was on equitable access to education, to community service, including equitable, equitable gender practices in education. And I was super inspired by the literacy campaign in Cuba because um, and I didn't get a chance to go to the literacy museum when I was there, but I definitely will when I go back. And I used to teach in Louisiana and Mississippi, and the students didn't have basic access to textbooks written in their decade. And privatization of education meant that talented teachers and educators could not support these students. But in Cuba, there's a 99% literacy rate. Whereas less than a decade ago, 66% of fourth graders in the United States couldn't read proficiently, despite access to plenty of resources under the capitalist regime. And despite a global pandemic, Cuba is still willing to share resources to share knowledge and to support struggles for sovereignty and self-determination all over the world. So the experiences we had in Cuba, you'll hear us talking about it. Um, we saw artists, we saw performers, we saw educators, we saw, and we learned so much from each other there. And it exemplified the importance of bringing back this feeling of sovereignty and self-determination. And even the leadership there, like someone mentioned, we got to speak with the president. They didn't shy away from presenting detailed solutions to support the efficacy of the revolution and the protection of the people. So human lives are actually valued there. Whereas we have leadership here that when asked questions about Palestine or the pandemic in general say, I love that for you, that you live in a democracy and you can ask those questions. However, don't present any real solutions or actions um, you know, to protect the people. So I believe that it was such a life-changing experience for me because it showed that Cuba is a model for the removal of this egoism and a determined collaborative structure that is not only rooted in community and rooted in progress through action, but it's a total opposition to a loose dedication to foolishness like we see in the United States. So one thing also um, I wanna close out by saying, we learned so much about Cuba's dedication to internationalism and whether or not we're looking at the struggle in Nicaragua Venezuela, Palestine, Puerto Rico, the Philippines, so many other countries that are, you know, being affected by U.S. imperialist tactics. In Cuba, we saw that despite 
all of the shenanigans caused by the imperialist regime, the people are still standing strong and see the benefits of the revolution and it will continue. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Shaquille. I mean, you, you, <clears throat> And so many speakers, I mean, you raised the, the, the important and critical, um, cr critical point. Um, but thank you. Thank you so much for your um, expertise, for your, but just your, your, your vision, you know, on what it means to be uh, a young person going to Cuba and seeing Cuba in this light uh, at this particular time. I'm superly appreciative. I want to move on to, um, our brother uh, Salifu, Salifu Mack, who is a Pan-African Socialist member of the All African People's Revolutionary Party, the Black Alliance for Peace, he's associated with as well as the Low Country Action Committee is a Black-led, which is a Black-led organization dedicated to Black or, uh, liberation through service, uh, political education, uh, and collective action uh, in the low country of South Carolina is also a co-editor of the African nationalist blog, Hood Communists. Those of you who have not checked Salifo out, or I mean, I'm not just saying, I mean, I've gotten to know Hood Communists through Salifo. It's not just Salifo. There are other folk that were involved. So it's not about him. But um, I have such a love and appreciation and admiration for my brother Salifo. Every time that I see Salifo on some kind of a report back or something, I mean, I just smile. I just smile. I'm like, yeah, that's right. Tell him like it is. I mean, you do it in a way that's just so, you know, look, I'm just here to tell you the truth. I want to hear whatever it is that you want to share, but I, you know, one of the things that, of course, many of our listeners know, many of the people who are listen to me, our listeners, I'm on this radio program, right? Many of those of us who are here um, know is that you, uh, Salifu, uh, had some really incredible writings out of the caravan experience, specifically as it relates to going to the MLK. I said the MLK. I'm sorry. The um, Fidel Castro Center. If you want to share on that, if you want to share on whatever you want to share about your experience as a caravanista, we're here to listen. The floor is yours, my brother. Thank you, Gail. Also, thank you everybody here in attendance. Salifu, I mean, um, Shaquille, I'm Salifu. Shaquille, you just killed it. So you got you got my energy high. So I'm gonna say this and I'm gonna try to make this quick. Um, me coming to the caravan, my first time ever going to Cuba, my first time ever going out of the country. I know a lot of people when they uh, make their trip to Cuba, you know, the advice that you get is, oh, you know, like go with an open mind and see what happens and like let it transform you. But like, I wasn't trying to go with an open mind because before I went to Cuba, I believed that I was an anti-imperialist. That was, that was, a, that was a, a politic that I firmly believed that was a part of, of who I was. And what I will say to anybody here that is thinking about making this trip with pastors, uh, with pastors for Peace to Cuba, um, and you are interested in anti-imperialism, absolutely go. Find a way, don't let nothing stop you because coming back from Cuba, I feel even more of an anti-imperialist than I ever, ever, ever could um, in my life. Right around the time um, that my interest in Cuba began to spark, the US State Department pulled out one of its old tricks, which was to dabble in this somewhat of like a identity reductionism, right? And I know all y'all remember all these headlines and all this Twitter conversation and Facebook and Instagram conversation that was coming out around Cuba being an anti-Black nation. Um, all this stuff coming out about you know Cuba suppressing the right of, um, of, of black people within its borders and all these things. And you have all these people coming out with their, with these lived experiences and all these Busanos from everywhere who were coming out to tell you like, yeah, don't believe anything progressive that you have to hear about, about, um, about Cuba on race. 
right? And so I feel like one thing that's important for people inside the United States, and I'm talking directly to Africans in the US and, um, and, and Black people in the US, however you identify in that sense, one thing we always got to remember about US imperialism, and Kwame Ture tells us this, is that capitalism, um, capitalism lies all the time. And even when it tells the truth, it's only the result of a double lie. So one of the things that stands out to me in my memory the most of my trip being in Cuba was the experience of being an African person coming from the United States, coming from a genocidal empire, coming from, an, of coming from living within the borders of a country that has done nothing but, but, but leverage genocide against my people since we were brought to this country um, centuries ago, right, has engaged in a nonstop process of genocide against my people to go to Cuba and experience for myself what it is like to breathe, to walk, to talk, to eat, to drink water in a nation that has respect for Africa and African people. Not just giving and offering lip service to this idea of, you know, Black Lives Matter or we love Black people, but a nation that has put it or put money on the table in a material way to demonstrate its commitment to challenging its colonial history, to challenging its colonial past. And another thing that really stood out to me was being in the presence of African people in Cuba who are organized to a T, right? Because I'm not gonna sit here and tell you, to come here to tell you as a Cuba evangelist that everything in Cuba is perfect for the Africans that live there and there's no problems. That's not my place. But what I'm here to tell you is that the Africans in Cuba are organized to a T to do anything that they feel is necessary to resolve any contradictions that exist in their society. They don't need people in America to, to worry or advocate on, on their behalf, because what I experienced while, while being in Cuba was the experience of being in a country that on a structural level, on a systemic level, is not engaged in everyday practices of racism and genocide against this African population, Afro-descendant population. And for me, that is an experience that I am never going to forget. That is an experience that when I was on the airport on the way back made me want to get a flag to hang up in my room because I want that to be a part of me. Cuba as a nation has decided that Africa is a part of it and I want Cuba to be a part of me. So I'm, I came back and I'm not going to lie to y'all, being back in the U.S. at first was a very jarring transition for me. I went through a deep, deep period of depression. Um, not just because of being back on the plantation, but also because um, as Shaquille pointed out, when you are in Cuba, you see what community looks like. You see what it means to exist in a, in a, in a neighborhood where on a block by block basis, there is organization to address so many things, whether it's disability rights, women's rights, the rights of Afro-descendant people, all these things are deeply embedded. There's all these structures and these mechanisms in place that the state is leveraging for people to be able to work within its system to fix. That is an experience that I know nothing of inside of the United States. We just, we cannot relate. And so that's my general message to anybody that's listening on this call, whether you are, um, whether you are, whether you're an African person who identifies as an African person or not, you have a huge responsibility inside the United States to push back on these kinds of narratives when they come out about Cuba and not be afraid to do so, because it is just the result of that ca capitalism has to lie. Y'all, the United States has to lie. It has to create an image that everybody around the world is just like it. And it's not true. And then speaking directly to any, any people who identify as African or Black on this call, if you've never been out of the United States, if you've never experienced a revolutionary society like Cuba, I am telling you, they will be the best thing you do all year to go with Pastors for Peace and to see that for yourself and to internalize it. My life is never going to be the same. And the definition of anti-imperialism went up like a hundred degrees for me since coming back. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, am I here? Thank, oh, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Thank you, Salifu. You know, Sometimes I, I mean, I just want to shut up. 
I just want to shut up and step to the side and hear from our, our young activists who have had the opportunity to go to Cuba, see it, experience it for, for themselves and just speak their truth. And, um, and you did that and I see you doing that time and time again. And I see that with each and every one of the speakers. And thank you, just thank you for being here. Thank you for just um, being a part of what made this 31st caravan special. But in addition to that is what's gonna make the next caravan special. I don't know, you know, there'll be some people who were on the last caravan that will go. There are some that will um, want to encourage other pe themselves to, to return, but other, other people to return. And however, however that makes sense, you know, we're open and willing and um, uh, wanting to embrace a whole new uh, cadre of people who are interested in going to Cuba and seeing it for themselves. Um, and I think that the work that each and every one of you have been engaged in, um, Aisha and David and um, um, uh, Mark, Shaquille, um, Salifu, we want to hear real quickly from um, um, Cheryl. Want to talk a little bit uh, about not just the experience of going on the caravan, but also what it means to like take it from here on, right? So those of you who have been on the caravan, it's been really exciting and energizing to see you engaged in, you know, the work. Um, the, in, encouraging other people to go, new people to go, um, hoping that many of you may consider returning. And if not you, maybe you can, you know, encourage other people to go. But I want to bring in, I, I intentionally asked Cheryl to kind of be our, um, our anchor and to come at the end and talk about what is it? What is it that we do moving here on? I mean, that's the big question, right, Cheryl? So what is it? What do we do? But Not, not, not a small assignment. Thank you. <laughs> but I knew if there was anybody who could handle it, it's my sister, Cheryl. Well, I think uh, the speakers today all had the, the nub of what, what needs to be done. Um, there is a disconnect, and I think all of us, maybe some people would disagree, but there is a disconnect between this government on all the different levels, but in the federal government in particular, which is the part that has the blockade laws, there's a disconnect between the people and the government. We've always known that there was oppression and exploitation and all that, but people are seeing it. Uh, more than a year ago, I noticed that there was a change. There was a podcast that popped up called Blowback. Why is a podcast doing a whole year's worth on the history of the U.S. war against Cuba? Why, why did they think that that was going to be popular, right? To me, being of a different generation, this was an indicator that things are changing. The Belly of the Beast, Fabulous Liz and all of that crew, that that is so popular. Things are changing. The fact that we've gotten all of these resolutions across the country more than 40 million people are represented. And there was another resolution last night that hasn't been published yet. Um, there is a, a change of opportunity and part of it was fired in addition to the conditions that we're facing by people being able to go to Cuba in a way that they hadn't been able to go before. I went to Cuba for the first time in 1985. I flew from Montreal. 
Direct flights from the United States didn't start until 2015. The fact that people were able to go, even not on a wonderful uh, packed trip like the one that, that we experienced in November where you saw and learned so much, that people were able to go and feel that feeling of freedom. I think it's the only way to explain it, that you go there and you have to fight hard not to love Cuba. You feel that there is another world that, that is possible, that we don't have to live this way. Maybe you can't put it into words, but you felt it. You felt it in the people, in the dignity that the people have in Cuba that people are denied here. We have a lot more opportunities for communication now with Cuba. Um, the ruling class in the United States tries to use it against Cuba, but we can also use it to fire the movement here in, inside the belly of the beast. Our, certainly we have to organize people to go to Cuba. That is number one. We have to fundraise. We have to find a way to help the people who need to go. I would say if you have been to Cuba before and you have the means to do so, again, please consider helping someone go for the first time. Someone from the black and brown communities who may not have the resources to be able to afford the uh, really now inflated prices. Uh, that's, that's one thing. We have to find a way to bring new forces, new young, uh, wonderful organizers like we've seen tonight to Cuba. But when we come back, there's another thing. How do we make this um, disconnect between the government and the people felt? How do we show that the people of the United States do not support the blockade? What, as, uh, as something that I remember like every day from when I helped to drive La Colmenita, the children, you know, the children's uh, the youth theater in Cuba, came to the United States to fight for the Cuban Five. And I, our dear uh, sister Alicia asked me to drive for them because it was like 30 people, 20 kids, a big production. And the, the children had made a, a play uh, about bringing the Cuban Five home. At the end of that play, they say, and now what more can we do? And since that time in 2011, that resonates with me. The question is, what more can we do? What more can we do? Are there organizations in our neighborhood are in our union, in our workplace, are there places we can reach out about Cuba? Let's think creatively on how to do it. Maybe it's around the medical school. Maybe it's around um, environmental issues. Is there a way that we can bring Cuba into the struggles that we're involved in every day? And then, how do we make it, how do we aggregate it? For example, the last Sundays of every month now, there are coordinated actions all across the United States and Canada and some other countries as well. But significantly here in the United States, the prosecutor of the Cuban people 
the origin of the blockade. It's here and it gives us a special responsibility. So every Sunday, this last Sunday of the month, the 30th of January, there are Los Angeles is doing something on the 29th, Portland, Seattle, uh, Phoenix, Albuquerque is doing a class, uh, Minnesota is doing a car caravan, New York is doing a car caravan, uh, Miami, which is where Cuban Americans first began this, uh, these car and bike caravans against the blockade, of course they're going to be out there too really face to face with uh, uh, the opposition in many cases. So that's great. And in our local area, that's great. You know, anytime we organize, we reach other people, we build our organizations. But when it's all taken together, that it's all of these cities, that it's united, that it's organized and um, and coordinated that there is a vehicle for immediately reporting it and that reporting can be re carried in Cuba immediately because we're organized and we're connected that makes it all the more powerful to have those you know Cuba has eight o'clock news and one o'clock news and to have that 8 p.m. news on Sunday have pictures from these different, usually not the West Coast because of the time difference, but from the East Coast and from Miami is a wonderful act of solidarity. Um, we did that and, and really Mark uh, was instrumental in this through the, the resolutions committee that we really found a way to turn lemons into lemonade when the pandemic hit. Out of that, we grew the Resolutions Committee, we grew the Saving Lives Campaign, and we continued building uh, a conference that will happen someday, uh, a U.S.-Cuba Normalization Conference. But we said, look, we've got these resolutions, what can we do with them, right? Well. We added up how many people, that's John Waller did a lot of that hard work, uh, to figure out how many people were actually covered by these resolutions. I mean, more than 41 million people are represented by labor yeah. and city council resolutions. So finding ways for us to work together, finding ways to not just do what we do in our own lives to be a, to oppose the blockade and build solidarity with Cuba, but find a way that we can bring that information together and make it stronger. Anyway, that is my very long-winded answer to that question of what what can we do? What can we do is on Sunday the 30th, we can right. do an event for Cuba and then keep doing it. You know, I think, um, Cheryl, thank you. Thank you so much for that detailed um, explanation because there's so much that we can and need to be doing. And I think, you know, the important thing is, yeah, we want people to go. We want people to go in the caravan. We want them to see the reality there, but we want to figure out ways that not only this upcoming caravan, we want to talk about that, but we want to look at ways that the current, the, the recently uh, returned caravan and any of Cuba's friends, um, because there's a lot of people that are on this call that are not just folks that have, have gone on the French shipment caravan, they might have gone on a different brigade or different connection to Cuba, maybe the, uh, the VB. Um, Vincent Ramos Brigade. We need to keep thinking about new and creative ways to keep doing the work, but I know it is nine. We're a little after the hour. We said that we would um, close up. I just want to thank each and every one of you again for being here. Um, 
for the people who were on the caravan who came and shared their stories, their realities. All of that is super important. And I'm grateful that we've continued to keep talking about Cuba. I think that's the important thing. So whether you've gone on the caravan or through the Vince Ramos Brigade or through the um, May Day Brigade that's coming up, um, want to make sure that you know those of you who might be interested in traveling, traveling down on the historic May Day Brigade to um, get information about that. So I'm going to encourage uh, Cheryl to put into the uh, ch uh, chat. Um, John, anybody else, put into the chat how people can um, engage in getting involved with the French, the caravan, but also the May Day Brigade that's coming up in May, where we want to get as many people as possible you know, involved and connected. So thanks. Thanks all for being here. I know it's late. I am. Um, I, we had talked about a Q&A. Angie, where's my Angie friend? Are we, um, I don't know where we are with any questions that might have come up in the chat or in the Q&A uh, or that we continue to share with uh, our staff to do um, follow-up responses to questions that might come up. Please, I would encourage you at this hour, we probably won't necessarily open it up to Q&A, but if there are any additional questions that you have that we can um, continue to respond to as time allows. Um, yeah, I think, um, Gail, I didn't really see many questions, mostly because we didn't ask for questions <laughs> um, in the beginning, but... Um, I do think that if anyone has any questions or if there are certain things that you, you came here to learn that didn't get covered, that didn't get addressed, that you are thinking of, please uh, email either me, Angie, at ifconews.org or um, email ifco at ifconews.org. That's our main email where you will meet uh, Emily Thomas, who does so much work for IFCO. Um, I think that that'll be great for leading us in a direction um, of what events to hold next and, and maybe where we can turn our attention because it's a, a back and forth loop, you know. Um, we need to know what people are wondering, what they are curious to know if they can't come to Cuba. And then um, we need to be looking at that as we experience it ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, I think what we need to put into the chat is write to us, write to us at ifco at ifconews.org. If there are any ideas or questions you have about caravans, about future future delegations, um, you know, I think this is the beginning, hopefully of, uh, you know, multiple conversations that we can have about Cuba and what it is that Cuba represents and what we can do to make connections between the struggles that we're engaged in here and how our friends are um, engaging, um, whether that's around housing or education or healthcare, um, food sustainability. There's a variety of different things that we can learn from our Cuban friends. So please write to us, write at ifco. Uh, ifco at ifconews.org. I think that there are people who are putting that information in the chat. Um, and let's see how we can be supportive of efforts that are already uh, going on and uh, new efforts that we can be uh, engaged in. So thank you. Thanks all for being here. It, Tanya um, does want to mention something, so. Okay. Give her the floor. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to say hello to all of my fellow caravanistas from oh, yeah. Friendship Me Caravan. I think one of the, I, I, like my brother Salifu and my soul sister Shaquille, they did an incredible job explaining what the experience was like while we were out there. One of the, one of the most amazing parts of this caravan was 
connecting with with the other caravanistas like as a young organizer in Chicago I have friends all over the United States now and there's so many things we have already talked about collaborating on Shaquille came to Chicago we were both at the national conference against uh racist and political repression we both made um presentations there I introduced a resolution there um, and, and just these connections have just been so inspiring. And I think because we have these connections and because we were all in Cuba, it just like makes it easier for us to re-motivate and re-inspire us in the movement for liberation and social justice in this country for marginalized people of color, um, because we can go to each other when we lose when we lose that, because it's hard when you're in a capitalist society and you know, and you're fighting for your people. So the, the friendship that we made has been just absolutely amazing. I just wanted to mention, because everybody does such a good job of explaining our experience out there, I just wanted to mention some of the things that we already, or that I've already put into practice since I've been back. We haven't been back um, for not even like two months, right? We, were, we came back at the end of November and just some things. So last night we had over a hundred people come to our in person <laughs> during COVID, during Omicron, come to the celebration of the Cuban revolution um, at Healthy Hood at my organization. Um, these were mostly people uh, in the creative community of Chicago and they came so, you know, mostly because they understand the mission of Healthy Hood, our organization. Um, and, and, but they came with open minds because we had been kind of getting them ready for it and explaining, you know, how all of the things and the propaganda that we've heard of Cuba are lies and how we needed to learn of their liberation movement because their liberation movement is our liberation movement here. Um, and so we had over 100 people come and learn about Cuba for the first time. We had a political education session by Professor Jose Lopez, who's a historian here in Chicago. I'm sure you all know who he is because he's absolutely amazing. He's also the brother of former Puerto Rican political prisoner, Oscar Lopez Rivera. Um, and so he came and gave, a, gave us our session and I was able to speak to the crowd as well about my experience on a caravan. And just a week before that on Sunday, within our own organization internally, we have 35 young organizers who are interested in going in July. We have a monthly meeting on Zoom. We just had our first one this month, but we'll be having it every month. And we'll be inviting Salifu and Shaquille and John and everybody on, on those monthly meetings to get our people ready and prepared. And I believe that 35 is where we're starting, but we might even be able to get more. So just as Cheryl mentioned, I think one of the biggest uh, hurdles for, of getting young organizers to Cuba is raising the funds. And so if anybody is willing to help us go to the next um, friendship and caravan, that, that would be really amazing. Because just like I said, we've I've only been back for less than two months. And some of the things that we've put into practice is number one, we've we've initiated a training for volunteers to start a door-to-door -door campaign, basically building out the consultario over a uh, part of the Cuban healthcare system, which is those doctors that are on every block. Now, of course, our volunteers are not doctors, but what we're training them to do is, is to screen for early detection for the five diseases that cause a life expectancy gap in Chicago, which is just a magnified reflection of the disparities that exist all over this country. So these volunteers are going to learn to take blood pressure, blood sugar, uh, do an asthma assessment, get people mammograms and so forth. And not only that, they'll be delivering free meals because we have a, a new partner that has prepped meals. Usually they throw it out, but now we're, we're called food um, rescuers and we rescue that food, we package it healthy. So we're delivering free healthy food to our people. Like the healthcare system here in the United States really has so, makes it so challenging for people of color to be healthy. So we're gonna do everything we can to be like the Cubans and make it easy for people to be healthy and really show that we care about them. Another thing that happened when I came back, there was this increase in homicide rates in my neighborhood, in, in the neighborhood of where our organization resides. And there had been three homicides in that week. Um, and so what we did was we held a community safety meeting that was um, called by our alderman, who is a so one of the only socialist aldermen in Chicago. If you don't know who he, he is, his name is Alderman Byron Sikcho. Um, and he, he called the meeting, but he allowed me to host it at my organization. And what we proposed was a CDP, which is just another version of the CDR. Most people that were there had no idea that it came from Cuba, but we were trying to explain that we needed committees for the defense of the people because what inspired me the most of the Cuban trip and why I came back hitting the ground running right away was the fact that the 
they, you know, the people just took it upon themselves and there's so much community participation to make sure that these systems work. And, and that's what we decided. We weren't gonna wait on the government. We weren't gonna beg uh, elected officials or, or wait for policy change. We were gonna start just figuring it out and, and um, applying what I learned in Cuba right away in our own community and hoping that that would spread. And, and, and just in this in these last month and a half, you can see how that has made an impact on our community because over a hundred people came to celebrate the Cuban revolution, even if they knew had no idea who Fidel Castro, if they've ever heard of him, he was he was uh, spoken in such a negative way. Um, and so I just, you know, wanted to mention that, you know, we're, we're really putting into practice the things that we learn. And one of the main things we talked about yesterday was starting a cultural revolution. And I think that's really what is the best thing to do in this country as a follow up to what we learned in Cuba is starting a cultural revolution amongst young creatives because in Cuba we learned that the creatives are the intellectuals and they're the ones with the ideas and that's what the community that we have in Chicago and just you know explaining that once we start to prioritize learning our own history and its connection to the rest of the world especially the liberation struggles of Latin America, then we will be stronger as revolutionaries in this country. And so uh, that's what we've been talking about in Chicago. And like I said, already 35 people want to go to Cuba, young organizers who are already involved in the struggle here for social justice. So I just say that to say we're trying to raise the money ourselves, but if there's any other help, please let us know. We're working really hard with John and Gail to make sure that we're doing things as creatives out there in Cuba. Once we get there, we got painters, musicians, all type of young people who really want to build relationships. And thank, thank, thanks to the caravan, I have friends in Cuba who I get to connect with and talk to almost every other day. Um, Juliet and Rosbel, they, they talk to me on WhatsApp all the time. And we're really trying to make sure that our people meet them ahead of time um, before they get there so that we can have an even better experience. So if you're interested in seeing how you can help us get there, because um, we're going to go with IFCO again in July, I def I would love to go every year if I can. Um, and, and just, you know, uh, help us out to get there because we're a lot of poor black and brown uh, young people here in Chicago and we really want to go and I know that we have the energy to really bring some things back um, because we showed it last night and I definitely will be emailing out the, the video uh, port, video version of our celebration last night because it was so beautiful we had live music we had you know, a bar, we had food, we had a political education session, there were books for sale, we, uh, we teamed up with the Chicago Cuba coalition here and all type of people I just wanted to know that I just wanted to let y'all know that the energy is still alive and, and we're really um, applying everything that I learned and we can't wait to take another delegation with you all in July. That's it. All power to the people. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. I just want to just express my love and appreciation for Tanya and um, you know all the work that you and your team have been doing. And I'm excited. I think um, we got a lot of work to do. Right? We got to get some of these these young, you know, uh, Chicago activists. I mean, I saw you. I see you out there a little bit. You know, I mean, I'm not the sharpest in the social media aspect, but I see you out there doing things. Um, Tanya, and I'm so appreciative of what you represent and what you want to bring to this work. And so, yeah, a lot to do, a lot to do that we can bring young people. I love this whole idea of CDP, Committees and Defense of the People, right? So those of you who have gone to uh, Cuba know about CDRs, Committees and Defense of the Revolution. And um, it's all the same. It's all the same. And it's beautiful. It's wonderful. And I'm excited to continue to work with you, uh, Tanya, and the whole crew that you have there. I know it's not just you. I know there's a whole crew of people that we need to be working with. So um, let's continue to be in communication. I know I'm not, I'm not always the sharpest on the on the uh, whatever, on the social media stuff, but you know, pick up the phone. I'm an old school person. Y'all be like, oh, text me, hit me up here. I'll do that, but call me, just call me, okay? Let me know that you still love me, Tanya, you know, cause we haven't really talked as much during the caravan as I'd like, but um, it sounds great. It's a lot of good work that we can do. Thank you all for being here. Thank you each and every one of you for sharing your energy or you know, your passion for what it means to be doing this work, you know, what Cuba represents and what, it can represent for the, the, the work that we're doing. 
in our own communities, whether it's around housing or health or education. I mean, I said that time and time again throughout the caravan, and I'm just sitting back and looking at, you know, you all wonderful, beautiful people doing the work and saying, let's make some links between what it is that is important and, and, and uh, valuable for our communities and how we can relate to what it is that Cuba can offer as an example. So thank you and thank you. I'm so excited just listening to Tanya. And Tanya, you still owe me some dance lessons because you know I'm a little talented on that, uh, on that front, but I know you can help me with that. But thank you all for being here. Thank you for doing this in beautiful, in important and, and beautiful work. Um, you know, Angie reminded me that one of the things I'm supposed to be doing, um, and she's not supposed to remind me, I'm supposed to remind you all that the important work of what we've uh, been doing is uh, related to um, support, financial support, um, spiritual support. Uh, but um, certainly reaching out, asking people to do what they can to help um, dig in and put money into the coffers. Um, I'm really not very good at the fundraising, but the point is we need you. We need you to help us by um, helping us to raise money to do this important work. Um, there's different ways that you can give. Angie's very thankfully put up this beautiful slide that shows that there are three different ways. You can send a check or a money order to IFCO. Um, you can send a, uh, you can send it to our PO box, PO box 1368, Orange, New Jersey, 07051 on the screen. Uh, you can um, send your donations via credit card uh, and, um, you know, let us know how you want to give and help us. Uh, reach out to us at IFCO by email at IFCO at IFCONews.org. By email at IFCO at IFCONews.org. And uh, let's continue to figure out ways that we can continue to do the important work that's involved in organizing the caravans, organizing this continued work to support the uh, caravan project, uh, but overall the work of IFCO. We're grateful for your being here, uh, for doing all that you do to continue to support us. We, can't, we really can't do this work without you. Um, too often people take for granted writing a check, writing out a small check, there are some people that write out a check as small as $10 a month, $25 a month, uh, in whatever way that you're able to support this ongoing ministry, this ongoing work, this ongoing commitment to building um, a different kind of a relationship, a different kind of a relationship between what it is that we, people of conscience, people of faith, are engaged in and... Um, you know, all of what's required to do this work comes from you. A lot of it is um, uh, very, um, it's small donations that, um, believe it or not, make a big difference in allowing us to keep our doors open. So thank you for what you continue to do. Thank you for continuing to help us build for the next caravan coming up. In 2022, in July, we hope that there are several people who were on this call that will think about coming again on the caravan. And if you can't come, you'll look at um, encouraging other people to join us in July as we continue to spread the word about what it is that Cuba represents and what it is that Cuba can offer us, those of us who are committed to justice. Um, how is it that we can make it uh, use of Cuba's experience? So thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for coming. Thank you for staying. And um, thank you for all you do to continue to support our work. Right. Thanks, Gary. Thank you. And thank you for all the people who came and spoke tonight. Um, 
Quilan. Thank you, Gail. I'm getting ready to butcher the name, but all of the wonderful people who came to be Don't no worry. We love you and appreciate you. Good night, all. Good night. Bye-bye. All the presenters. We came to speak. Join us. Join us this July on the next caravan. Emily was there.